think of BIM as a technological revolution. Profit is the first thing to go when there's a problem. Why don't we figure out a new paradigm? Everybody is contractually together in one contract. Welcome to the BIM Student Podcast. In this podcast, we talk to leaders, followers, innovators, and adopters from our AEC industry. Like a student, I ask questions that we all wanted to ask on our digital transformation journey, but never actually did. I explore concept, products, ideas, and future possibilities in digital transformation space. Each week, I meet with an amazing guest from the industry. I look forward to learn something new, share new experiences, thoughts, and opinions, and how to make BIM journey better for everybody across the board. Today's episode is a continuation of last episode where we talked to Geza Benfai about IPD projects. We explored how has integrated project delivery become the most logical way of project delivery now in construction industry. In today's episode, we will focus on how BIM has been the most essential part of IPD project. Let's listen in. Well, you know, I forget when, but you know, some years ago, I think the germ of this idea actually originated in the uh, oil fields off uh, the northeast of, of uh, Scotland, the, the people developing those oil fields. The idea was, the basic idea that bubbled up was, why don't we figure out effectively a new way of contracting with one another that um, focuses on different things than what I've just been describing? Mm-hmm. Why don't we figure out a new paradigm? And what has emerged uh, thus far, I think it's the highest point of development of this thinking, is IPD. So the essence of IPD there are a number of sort of principles and key characteristics to an integrated project delivery model. And I'll just list them for you. The first and most critical is a single contract involving multiple parties. So you don't have these boxes and the silos. You have one contract. Everybody is contractually together in one contract, which is quite an interesting uh, legal construct. That's CCDC 30. Another key principle, the early involvement of the key participants in the project. And by early, I mean early, as in day one. The theory. You mean even when like the project is being discussed with the owner? When the owner is conceptualizing that I want to build so-and-so stuff at that time. Exactly. Exactly. You've got it. I mean, the theory, you know, and, and a, tr- a true IPD, in practice, it, you, you have variations on this, but the, but the theory that, that's sitting within CCDC 30 is that as at the date that you sign the CCDC 30, and by you, I mean owner, designer, mm-hmm. general contractor, and probably the, the key trade contractors, mechanical, mm-hmm. electrical, perhaps cladding, it depends on the job. Mm-hmm. So you have this collection of people all of whom sign on on day one. As at that moment, there is no project. Oh. All you have is what I like to say is, you know, a gleam in the owner's eye. The owner has a certainly a conception of what mm-hmm. the owner wants. Mm-hmm. It, it may be reasonably well-defined. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking for a student residence to house 300 students. You know, I'm building should, a cancer wing next. I'm building a cancer wing. Uh, yeah. So it has to accommodate, you know, the, so the owner has has some certainly mm-hmm, some conception mm-hmm. and it, it may it's more or less refined in the owner's mm-hmm. mind, at least. The owner also probably has a budget. In mm-hmm. mind. They may or may not have a, land, a piece of land. Often they do. Sometimes they don't. Mm-hmm. In any event, you assemble the team Mm-hmm. sign the contract mm-hmm. and then begins an ipd then mm-hmm. begins the first phase which is called validation and validation can last some time uh you know two months a year oh it, it depends it depends on the project and the parties and so on but what goes on in the validation f- phase is you get from this 
point of there being no real project yet to the end of validation, at which time the owner makes a go or no go decision Mm -hmm. to proceed or not. The vast majority of the time, the owner does proceed. But what happens during that during that period is that the team meets Mm -hmm. and the design is evolved from perhaps nothing to shall we say 30 40 50 percent it depends mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it devolves to a point that's considered collectively by the group to be sufficiently advanced to allow people to make informed educated guesses about mm-hmm. cost and constructability mm-hmm. and timing and all of that it allows mm-hmm. the owner to make an informed go no good decision other things happen during validation as well. To state the obvious, the, the, the team as a team gels. And this is the idea. Again, you learn how to collaborate. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to learn how to collaborate. This is just human nature. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, Chetna, you, I don't know you that well. I don't know whether you and I could ever collaborate, but mm-hmm. I do know that we could learn to do so. And I know that it would be a process. Mm-hmm. We, we would have to go from here to there. So, but you, you know, on a macro level, in a construction project, that's an important aspect of the validation phase. Another very important thing that happens during validation is that, well, all the parties except the owner collectively agree on what in IPD speak is called the risk pool. Mm-hmm. And it is of the essence of of IPD that the design and construction team identify their profit expectations. That fund is set aside in a risk pool so that the profit is at risk pending performance, you know, or compliance with project objectives that the team itself collaboratively agrees upon. Those project objectives could be, well, meeting budget, Mm -hmm. meeting schedule, meeting perhaps quality constraints, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the risk pool is out there and Mm -hmm. and remains at risk pending performance to meet Mm -hmm. those those criteria. And this idea about the risk pool sometimes strikes people as a little odd, except that, you know, when you think about it, uh, for a contractor or or a design professional even, uh, profit is always at risk. <laughs> you know, profit is the first thing to go when there's a problem. It's always at risk. The difference in IPD is that this subject is dealt with very intentionally and consciously. Right. You can't be the ostrich digging your head oh, in no. the sand and thinking that, oh, nothing's bad going to happen. Oh, quite the opposite. Uh-huh. It's quite the opposite. Which gets at another aspect of IPD, which is collaborative Mm decision-making in a a collective manner. Mm -hmm. In IPD speak, we we, we have what's called a big room. Mm -hmm. It's literally a room where the the participants basically plan and build the project. I've seen a couple of big rooms uh, in my life, and and, uh, they're interesting places. it's, It's a larger room, and along the wall... Well, you've got computers and printers all over the place. And along the wall, you have, and there are desks and so on, where people can congregate and work in this collaborative manner. But along the wall, you have cork boards and charts and all kinds of information about everything that's important, Mm -hmm. such as uh, uh, cash flows. How is the cash that we anticipated to flow in our pre-planning actually mm-hmm. flowing on this job schedule how is the schedule you know are the, that we pull planned how are we meeting our schedule objectives here it's all there for all to see and you know big room meetings typically take place at least once a week mm-hmm. sometimes more often uh, this is where you know the group as a whole mm-hmm. works together to plan and build the project and to monitor it one of the things about big room is that it's as to get back to your ostrich point you can't hide in there and also there's the there's kind of a cultural 
aspect to a big room, and that is you have to sort of leave your ego outside. Yeah, you know, you know when you were talking about, I'm sorry to cut you there. Avinash talking yeah. about uh, talking about this. The one thing that was going on in my mind that a lot of type A personalities like me mm-hmm. are going to have hard time because we like things going the way we want them to go away. And at one point of time, I have to sit back, relax, and just let somebody else take the lead for something else. And just mm-hmm. maybe, and then just watch that their this decision might put my profit at risk. Imagine what it's like in a big room where you've got a senior architect who's won Governor General's medals, and you've got a you know a, a general contractor representative who's been doing this stuff for thirty years and he knows how to do it, and you've got a mechanical contractor representative who uh, you know knows all about mechanical contracting and this is how it's going to happen. It's quite a brew. Mm-hmm. Um, it is possible, and the the secret is uh, effective leadership. And this is the fascinating part about IPD, because what we're talking about here is is something that, you know, construction people tend not to take all that seriously, though they should, and that's the soft skills, Mm. active listening, empathy, withholding judgment, you know, all of those so-called soft skills Mm -hmm. that are in many ways foreign to so many in this business. That's where the power lies. And, you know, in, in my somewhat limited experience, but, you know, my, my observation is that, you know, successful big rooms are successful because inside that room, there's at least one person who is, uh, who, who is capable of engaging with, you know, that all of those type A's mm-hmm. and over time, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it's a process, but getting to a point where, people learn that there's value in just listening, working through a problem, and so on. So it's, it's something that, that is capable of being taught and capable of being learned. And the, the only reason I know this mm-hmm. for a fact is because I've talked to people who've done IPD jobs, ranging from you know, senior executives to foremen. And so far, every single person I've talked to, I just asked them the open-ended question, would you do this again? You know, how do you like it? Every single person so far, without exception, has said, I would never go back to the old way of doing things. Wow. Now, that has, a way of, that has a way of getting your attention. When you, wow. when, you hear that, when you hear that from a grisly old construction veteran, I would never go back. And I, I, and I did. I did hear it from a grizzled, grizzled old construction executive once, and I said, "Well, why do you say that?" And he said, "I just got sick and tired of waking up every morning to go have a fight." Ah, uh, right. And the foreman that I asked that question of gave me the answer. Gave me a, a response that that really touched me. Um, this was a guy. He was a. I think he was a forming foreman. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he'd been working in the trench literally all his life. He was mm-hmm. in his young, you know, early fifties. Mm-hmm. And so I met him in the hallway and I just started talking to him and I said, you know, what do you think about this IPD stuff? And, you know, he, he looked at me and I guess no one had ever sort of asked him that question. Before. Oh. <laughs> and it, it really touched him because his eyes got kind of watery. And he got kind of, got a little emotional, which is kind of odd for a 50 something, you know, forming foreman. Mm-hmm. And he said, I love it. And I said, well, why? And he said, they listen to me here. Wow. So think about that. You know, this is the guy who's and mostly they're guys still, but this, this is the person who's actually doing the work. Right. He has forgotten more about forming than everybody else, all the other high-priced, educated consultants in that room will ever learn because he knows forming in his hands, right? But, you know, how often do you actually ask that guy? How can we improve the forming process on this job? How can we make forming go faster? Those kinds of questions. And that, that too goes on in a big room. 
so it's a process that is it's good for the soul. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, one of you heard a construction lawyer talking about soul, but it is good for the soul. And you know, I personally, I think this is actually very, very important. You know, because you know, in my career, I've watched too many people just get burned, burned yeah. up. And you know what, Giza? I don't know how many architects might you have heard this from. Okay, so you know what? Have you heard this story about the Taj Mahal that? It was built by Shah Jahan and, and it's one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. But he cut the hands of the people who worked on that so that they cannot make anything. Wow. Like that. Have you heard wow. about this? I didn't hear. I didn't know that. Okay. So, yeah, this, this is the story behind it. So the emperor who got this constructed, he said, I'll take care of you. Like, I'll give you enough money that takes care of you for the entire life, but I will cut your hands so that you cannot make anything like this ever again. (laughs) So, you know, when I went to see Taj Mahal, it's not the beauty and the symmetry and the, all the, all the things that we learned in architecture school about it. It's not that, that, I noticed, but what I noticed is that first it's a tomb, like there are two dead people lying in there, right? right, right. But it's also the pain and the, the suffering of those workmen. So yes, this is this is a beautiful carving on the wall, but you know, the person who did this might not be able to do anything else in life. And that kind of, you know, takes the soul away from it. It's it's a beautiful building from outside, but if you go in there and you will find a lot of people say when they go in there, they when they come back, they come with a very unrestful uh, mind because there is a soul behind it. And and the architects who are really passionate about their work and who do this, you know, who love architecture, they try and put the soul in the building. So when the foreman who's constructing the building is loving what he's doing, he's putting a part of his soul into the building, which... Ultimately, you and I are, you know, we're going to visit that cancer wing to uh, sometime, or we're going to go and drop our kids to that student residence sometime. So yeah, buildings do have soul. I believe buildings have souls. So, and yeah. it, it comes with the collective effort of people um, who, who build it and design it. So we kind of do a lot of detail here. No. One thing I want to touch upon is how is BIM an important part of IPD yeah. and why can we not just use CAD and the traditional way of yeah. working on drawings to be yeah. in an IPD project? Yeah, this gets at something else and that's that's technology mm-hmm. and how technology interplays with paradigm shifts. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is really interesting to think about. Going back to the science, um, you know, the, the paradigm shift from Newton to Einstein, mm-hmm. I think was caused by the crisis that technological change had created. You know, when Newton was around, the scientists didn't have any way of, of looking at things that were very small or, you know, studying light and other and electromag- the electromagnetic spectrum very deeply. But in the intervening period, into the late 1800s and 1900s, the, the technology of, the, of that, of that the ability to, to make instruments to study those things increased exponentially, and scientists were finding that what they were that what they were finding wasn't explainable using Newton's paradigm. Hence, Einstein in construction. I'm old enough to remember when architects and designers used drafting tables. Mm-hmm. Do you know what a drafting? You even know, Chetna, Do you even know what yes, a drafting table? Yes, yes, I've okay. used one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean it's not a silly I, question. I might you know? look young. I'm not so young. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, all right. I just assumed that you would have no idea. So a long, long time ago, I spent my first year of, of undergrad in, in engineering science at U of T, and, and before I realized that I didn't want to be an engineer, I wanted to be a lawyer. But I took a course uh, in my first year at U of T in drafting and we had drafting Mm -hmm. tables and it was a surprisingly difficult course because they were extremely picky about, you know, the sharpness of the pencils, the width of the lines and so on. It was an interesting discipline. Okay. So that's how design happened Mm -hmm. until very recently, Mm -hmm. you know, people, designers working over drafting tables, creating designs. 
Mm-hmm. You know, then along comes CAD, which is essentially the same thing, except that instead of the paper, you replace it with a computer screen. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, as you know, that, that you know, in, in both of those, in either of those, it's pretty hard to collaborate with anybody, you know, except maybe, you know, the designer at the next table mm-hmm. or somebody else in your office. Mm-hmm. You certainly can't easily collaborate with the owner mm-hmm. or with the, with the trade contractor mm-hmm. or with anybody else. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, part of that old and existing paradigm is the preparation of a design by a designer sitting in relative isolation, mm-hmm. which is then, as an architect once told me, thrown over the fence to the contractor mm-hmm. to just go and build it. And that's design, bid, build. That's CM, yeah. you know? And we all know about some of the problems that emerge from that. The thing about BIM is that it's a technological, I mean, I, th- I think of BIM as a technological revolution mm-hmm. that both precipitates the kind of crisis that I was talking about in the Kuhnian sense and enables mm-hmm. things to happen that were not possible before mm-hmm. BIM. I'm talking about that collaboration. Right. You know? I mean, it's no secret, although it may be a secret to some designers, but it's no secret to my mind that a contractor has valuable things to say about a design. There's lots of value in a contractor's input into a design. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's thing, there are things that contractors know from their, there are things that that foreman knows yes. from his experience that the designer cannot know but should it would be useful to know in the course of preparing the design yeah i can say a lot of architecture that i know has come from construction site like the architecture school and the uh, two years just working in the office only made me ready to understand the language of contractors Mm -hmm. only made me equipped that I can interact with them. Yes. I didn't know. I okay. I designed and calculated this complex spaces. I made three D views out of it. But what it takes to make that that three D space work at site, and should I be even putting that beautiful cornice? You know, it just changed the mind if you talk about it. And and BIM does bring a lot of, like, we all think and imagine in pictures and like 3D, right? Yes. I don't think in flat lines. Yes. And a lot of people cannot think, like, they need to see something in front of them. Like, I could be an imaginative thinker. I could be a, a visual thinker. Not many people are a visual thinker. So they need to see in order to build or in order to understand. So that part definitely BIM takes care of, but let's get to Yeah, I think most people think visually in pictures. Mm-hmm. I think, I, you know, uh, certainly children do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, I have a whiteboard in my office. And mm-hmm. They kind of laugh at me because mm-hmm. I have a whiteboard in my office, but I say, it's not, <clears throat> in many ways, I'm still that six-year-old kid who's got to write on the wall in order mm-hmm, to think. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Anyway, but you're also talking, you know, you've, you've touched upon what, uh, another benefit to, and that is that it has to do with assessing, confirming, determining the, the constructability of that great design that you're creating. And I'm sure you've had the experience Chetna, in your in your career of coming up with just a wonderful, amazing design, but it's really hard or impossible to actually build it. <laughs> and, and leave a part on budget and on time. <laughs> on budget and on time. And so, you know, the, the collaboration that's intrinsic to BIM and mm-hmm. then and then as part of an IPD process in that big room during mm-hmm. validation is all about that it's all about but it's all about you know translating that amazing conceptualization of that physical space that that you bring to the thing okay into something that can actually 
be built in a reasonable fashion. And, you know, there's so many historically, there's <laughs> not, not that historically, but there's so many problems in construction arising precisely out of that. Right. Right. You know, so now the next, uh, so now the next part is impossible questionnaire. Uh, mostly this is the time in the most podcasts I'm learning from my guests. I'm learning from their experience and their understanding of the subject matter. This is my time when I do show off that I don't know some things more than you do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and just, just to make you feel better about it. If I didn't have that questionnaire and the answers right in front of me, I wouldn't know the answers. <laughs> the, the, okay. <laughs> so, and I've done little in that research. Mostly it's my team who's put those questions together. So I'm, right. only, I'm only the one who's asking these questions. So let's start with an impossible questionnaire. These are three questions, all related to construction industry in one way or the other. Nothing related to CCDC. I do have some CCDC related questions, but I'm not going to ask you those questions. So let's start. First question. What is the minimum allowable length of bearing of a wood joist on masonry? <laughs> the minimum allowable length. I'm guessing eight feet. Eight feet? I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Obviously. Okay, I'm going to give you another hint in this. So we have a masonry, like maybe a wall or something, and we're trying to put a floor joist on it. Right. How much bearing or how much overlap does that foot, that joist should have on that masonry? Eight feet is a lot. Oh, 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 sorry. So you've got the masonry wall, then, then you've got the joist. So the question is, what's the, what's the overlap? Yes. What's oh, the okay, minimum okay. allowable? Minimum. What is the ah. least that you can get away with? Uh, pure guess. Uh, six inches. Um, it is 40 mm, which is about three inches. A little less than wow. two inches. Okay. Well, at least I was in the neighborhood. <laughs> and you know like we uh, i was listening to a podcast yesterday and this guy he's very passionate about sustainable design he said you know what we design according to the code is actually the least um the a building with like the the best worst building that you can design right it's the bare <laughs> minimum <laughs> <laughs> that's one way so, of putting it yeah so so, so the, the building code gives you like this is the bare minimum you have to do and when we comply with the code we're so proud of it oh we comply with the code don't understanding that this is the bare minimum that we have to do so mm -hmm. this is the bare minimum 40 mm mostly i would go with like four four inches so that it's it has a proper joint with the with the masonry but yeah 40 mm. you uh, you have to understand chetna that in my life i've built relatively few things but one, one of the things i did once build mm -hmm. was uh, some built-in bookshelves mm -hmm. in, a, in a house and this thing is so overbuilt first of all i was not constrained by a schedule so it took months Mm -hmm. But this thing is so overbuilt that anyone taking it out is going to have a hell of a time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I tend to overbuild. Anyway. I, I so know, six I inches know for me, mean. lady. I know what you mean. <laughs> I know what you mean. My, my right. parents' house was bought by um, a friend of theirs when they were moving and then they wanted to do some renovations. And they said, I don't know what you put in the floor slab. We cannot cut a hole in there. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to take a new staircase I'm like yeah <laughs> that's called construction quality yeah right okay, okay. so the next question is um let me be a little little easy on you hmm. uh what type of soil has the most ideal permeability for the construction of a sewage system oh Okay, so it's a silty sand, well-graded gravel, inorganic silts, 
or organic clay or like high plasticity soil. So which is the best kind of soil for building um, seaweed system, a seaweed system? All right. You're looking at soil that is going to be uh, holding surrounding mm -hmm. pipes. Right. So silty sand. I'd, I would I would feel I, I would I would guess clay, mm -hmm. and the only reason is that you know clay is thick, mm -hmm. relatively stable, mm -hmm. and it provides a to my mind it provides a firmer uh, foundation. You're going to need some gravel in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to rest the piping on, but I would surround it with clay. If I was building a septic bed, though, what I'd be looking for is lots of permeability because the, the wastewater has to trickle away. And, mm -hmm. and, and so you're looking at probably a gravel bed and, and silty sand or something like that. You don't want it pooling as it would in a clay soil. Okay. But, so know, do I, I don't know? even know if I should give you this. The answer okay. says silty soil, silty sand. But I think where you come, I understand the logic where you're coming from. Uh, that if we need like solid pipes to hold it, we need something that's stable, not silty and gravelly that will move around. Um, okay, I will give you this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a simple one. What is 5D BIM? What is what? 5D BIM. Length, width, height, time, and cost. So what is 5D BIM? It, it's, it's BIM that, that addresses each one of those parameters. The three spatial ones, plus schedule, plus cost. No, the term 5D BIM. I'm not talking about the five dimensions of BIM. If somebody says we are doing the 5D BIM, what exactly are they doing? That's what I thought they were doing, but you're about to correct me. I'm, I'm very interested to learn this. So I, I, so, I just assume that 5D BIM, BIM is a model that in addition to, to dealing with the, the, the 3D, mm -hmm. uh, it also allows the capability of dealing with, with schedule. Uh, and 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 the financial cost, the costing of the elements as they go in. But I'm, I may be okay. mistaken there. You're partly correct here. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, 5D BIM is a process of using the BIM data for the cost analysis. So okay. it doesn't have anything to do with the schedule. Or maybe there is some part of schedule to it, but it is the, the inclusion of information that helps to facilitate accurate cost estimates or use of BIM okay. data for accurate cost, cost analysis. So, okay. Okay. so you're, you're, you're there, but uh, 3D is when we see like a geometry. Right. 4D is when we're using the geometry and the data for scheduling. Okay. And 5D is when we're using that 3D and that data for cost. So if I see the pipe oh. there, I attach the number, the per right. unit price to it. If I see the wall, I attach the price to it. And right, then right, when right. I get that information, that's my 5D BIM. So 5D does not uh, include scheduling. No, schedule's done before oh. that. It's in 4D. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, so I've you're learned, partly correct. I've you're, learned something. That's great. You're, you're smart, Geza. You're very I, smart. <laughs> You can well, I've learned a lot. I've learned it's three inches, not six. You know, that's I'm going to remember that. And now I know about 5D, uh -huh. and I'll debate you about that sewer pipe. <laughs> uh -huh. I, well, educate me. I would, I would love, like, I'm at the, and that's why the name of the, uh, the podcast is The BIM Student, too, because I am the BIM student here. I am the one who wants to learn. And in my process of learning, if, if anybody else can, can benefit that's that so this podcast is very personal like learning process for my for me uh, no. okay so we are almost towards the end of the podcast now and to wrap everything up and to finish it with the rose bud and thorn of IPD project so somebody who's maybe not ever worked on IPD project what is the rose the bud and the thorn that they can expect. So rose is the benefit of today. Bud is the benefit that we see in the future. And thorn is a challenge or a side effect. And I think we did address it, but let's just sum it up. 
I think we did two. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the rows, the benefit today is projects, uh, a much increased probability of a project coming in mm -hmm. on time or earlier mm -hmm. and on budget or below budget. In mm -hmm. other words, meeting the expectations of the owner. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, you know, a much, a much heightened chance of that happening. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, benefits tomorrow, mm -hmm. better buildings, better infrastructure. Uh, constructed with fewer problems, fewer disputes, more of the energy mm -hmm. being directed exactly where it should be, which is in maximizing the... The creativity of the thing, maximizing the value of that which you are building. That that mm -hmm. will take time. Mm -hmm. Thorn challenges, the cultural changes, the the, uh, the personal growth and the cultural change that's mm -hmm. that's necessary in order to uh, make IPD and even even BIM <laughs> to some extent. Yes. Uh, 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 to increase the rate of adoption. Right. You know, it requires a change of thinking right. and it requires a change for most of us, all of us. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. requires a change of culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm optimistic. I'm mm -hmm. very optimistic. You know, um, the the culture of the industry, uh, you know, where where does it sit? Well, it, you know, it, 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 it sits it sits in the people mm -hmm. who have built it and who mm -hmm. maintain it mm -hmm. but where is its future it's its future is in the young and i put you in that category despite the fact that you are you know obviously 65 years old but in incredible shape chedna <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling your leg but i but i put but i but i, I put my faith in 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 your generation and those and those you know behind you um for so many reasons not, not least of which is that, you know, you and your contemporaries have had, like my own children, you know, have grown up uh, with iPhones and iPads and texts, and they've grown up in an intensely collaborative milieu. Mm -hmm. but it does, you know, it's, it's absolutely second nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have this feeling that uh, you know, those of those of your generation and the people younger than you, if if one were to sort of have them listen to this podcast, listen to my description about how the industry works, mm -hmm. and then ask, you know, and then ask them for their reaction, I would I it would not surprise me if 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 many of them in a very visceral gut level way said, Are you people out of your minds? Like what what do you, what do you mean you don't collaborate with one another? What are you talking about these silos and maximizing profit and and what do you this this is this is a crazy way to do things mm -hmm. you know especially when you don't have to yeah. when for example you know you can you can use bin you can you can co-locate in big rooms you could talk you can talk to the people who are actually intimately involved in the activity communication is straight up it's not mm -hmm. done through a chain of people um, and isn't that, you know, I can, I can see, you know, younger people saying, isn't that the sensible way to build things? And has <laughs> it always been a, the sensible way to, like, what, what, you know? So I'm, 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 I'm optimistic, okay. very optimistic. And I, you know, and, you know, I, I commend you and, and your team for, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, it's a, it's a tremendous value to, uh, to all of us. So keep up the good work, you know, keep it up. You're on the right track. Okay. Thank you so much, Geta. It has been so much. It's been one of, in a long time, I've had a guest. I had so much to learn from. Um, actually, every guest has their own, um, their own value to add. But today's podcast, I just didn't realize we've been way, way over time. Because Are was, we? Oh, oh, we're having... Oh. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> we had a pretty good engaging discussion. This is going to be one of the longest longest um, episodes of the season, but 
um, oh boy, I have learned something today. Thank you well, so much I've... for your wisdom. Thank you so much for your, for your time. Well, it's, it's a pleasure, Chetna, and thank you for asking me. And, uh, and uh, carry on. Carry on with the good work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.